Um, the next talk is Running Debian on Inexpensive Network Attached Storage Devices, and your speaker is Martin Michelmeyer, about whom I promise not to say anything evil. Enjoy. Hello. Well, there is nothing. Huh? Is it on? I don't think, yeah. Well, there, there is nothing evil to say anyway, anyway but with Netty, you never know, so I'll just be careful. <laughs> well, next time she's definitely not going to say nice <laughs> things about me. Um, so the, uh, this talk is uh, about a couple of different things uh, related to NAS devices. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start by showing a couple of devices which we currently support. And then, since this is uh, DebConf, and I'm hoping uh, to get other people involved, um, I'm also going to show what kind of changes, uh, if you want to add a new device to Debian Installer, what kind of changes uh, you need to make. Finally, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons I learned, because I've been um, doing Debian on, on NAS stuff for quite a while. And it, it's quite interesting to in interact with users and to see what kind of issues they have and, and maybe we can think about how we can improve that. So, so what are NAS devices? So it's, it's basically, uh, I mean, they're, they're really popular these days because everyone wants to store their, their MP3s or their data. So it's, it's basically an external hard drive um, but with some more logic in it. So it's not just a USB disk but it's actually a full uh, machine, so it has memory, um, it has a CPU, and so you can actually run a full uh, Linux system on it. So, and, and that makes it interesting um, because with, with, if you look at, uh, for example, access points, you can run uh, open WRT on it, um, it runs from flash, but you, you can't really run Debian on most uh, access points simply because they don't have the storage for a full uh, Linux or Debian system. But with the, the network attached storage devices, I mean, they have plenty of storage, so why don't you just put you know, Debian on it? Um, and it's, it's nice because they, they're generally pretty power efficient. Um, they're usually pretty quiet. Um, and uh, they, they are quite cheap. I mean, it, there is a big range. Some of them are quite expensive. Um, unfortunately, especially those, um, some of them which we support are quite expensive, but they're also quite nice. But we actually support a quite range these days. Um, and in my opinion, they, they make a pretty nice home server if you don't need too much. So now I'm, I'm just... Uh, I'm going to present two devices in detail and then just give a list of devices we, we support. And the two devices I'm showing, the first one is, is the, the Linksys uh, NSLU2, the slug. Um, and I, I'm showing that simply because it's very popular. There are many people who use it. Um, that was the reason why the, the Debian ARM port became uh, very popular and is the, the third most popular port at the moment. Um, to, to me, this device isn't very interesting anymore, um, simply because it's, it's quite old, it's quite slow. It, it doesn't offer very much, but it, it's very cheap and so it's very attractive for people. Um, but fortunately now, there is actually a replacement um, available. But so with, with the slug, um, it, it has 32 megabyte memory, it has a CPU that, that does either 133 or 266 megahertz, so you can see it's, it's really very basic. Um, you can run Debian, but it's not going to be very fast. I think Wouter um, <laughs> blocked about that when, when he bought it, and then he realized just how slow it is. I mean, you, you can't expect, expect magic, um, but, but since it's very cheap, it, it's it is very popular. A nice thing about the slug is also that the firmware can be upgraded over the, over the, the network, which, which is very useful because if, if for some reason Debian doesn't boot anymore and most of those devices don't have a serial console by default, so you don't know what's going on. Um, and so people can take a rescue image and, and flash that via the network. So that's a very good rescue option. Um, well, 
th there are a couple of disadvantages. The Ethernet needs some proprietary microcode. So even though we have Debian installer support, we need some unofficial images um, to actually have Ethernet support. Um, and it, it's very slow. It doesn't have enough memory. So like I said, it, it's not so interesting anymore. To me, it's in maintenance mode. It, it basically works. Um, so I would just skip that to the, the more exciting stuff. And the device I'm really excited about at the moment is the, the Shiva plug, um, because it's, it's a really good replacement for the, the slug. Um, it, it's much faster. So it has a 1.2 gigahertz CPU. It has 512 megabyte RAM and 512 flash. And it has one USB, so you can again um, connect a, a hard drive. It's, it's really pretty small, so that's the, the Shiva plug. Um, and it's available for $99 with that 1.2 gigahertz CPU and 512 RAM. So it, it's really a very good tea, deal. Um, so it's, it's, it's cheap. It does, uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty cheap, as I said. Um, it's very quiet. doesn't have a fan. It actually has enough flash to run uh, Debian. At the moment, we, we don't support that. Um, but there is a Google Sum of Code project. Um, Marvell, I mean, they've been making those devices basically to promote the whole platform. And the nice thing is that the, the CPU they use, um, they have, uh, over the, the last year or two years, they have become very open because with Marvell, a few years ago, I saw those CPUs coming out and basically I said, I'm not going to touch that because you know, it's evil stuff, it's not documented. The, the Linux, which they have, is you know, their own hacked version, and there was just no mainline support. And, and suddenly, Marvell started to hire um, two um, of the main um, kernel hackers and a couple of other people who know about free software and open source. And so now they have a mainline port. Um, they have a couple of people working on it. Um, they have open documentation, so it's, it's a really interesting platform. Um, and so this one is really aimed for, for people who want to do something, who want to hack it. So you... Away? Yeah. Okay. No. Is that... Is it? Okay. Um, so it, it actually so it has a mini USB. Um, which uh, has both serial and JTAG. Um, so JTAG can be used if, if you, for example, brick uh, the machine by overwriting the bootloader, you can restore that. You, you can basically flash the, the, the bootloader again. Um, so it's a really interesting device. And um, the, the only problem at the moment, uh, in my opinion, is that it's not very available, because at the moment you basically have to, to order it from the States. Um, I know some people from Europe have done that, and the the, the import tax wasn't too bad, but it's still, you can't go to a shop and just buy it as you, as you can with the slug. Um, but I think that's changing. So Marvell recently made an announcement that they have made some deals with, with a number of, of uh, big companies like Buffalo um, to produce those devices. The only thing, I don't know if, if those devices are going to have the, the serial and the, the JTAG, um, because there is um, something called the Pogo block which is basically this device, um, but without the, the serial and the JTAG. So this is called the, the development uh, platform. But that's something we will see. Um, so the, the status, so it's currently under development. It's, it's still pretty new. So we have a kernel in the archive, uh, which, which works. And on my web page, I have a tarball of Debian Lenny with, with a newer kernel, and that can be installed very easily. Um, you just partition the disk, unpack it, make some changes in U-boot via the serial, so it's, it's very easy. Um, and Debian installer support, most of it has been integrated, um, but it, it needs a new release, um, so it, it will actually be available for people. And like I said before, at the moment, uh, we don't support installations to, to the internal flash, um, so you can install to USB disk or to a SD card. Um, but hopefully um, in the future we will also be able to directly uh, install to Flash. So a couple of other devices which are already supported. 
Um, so they're grouped into um, which platform it is. So the, the first one is the Intel IOP platform, which essentially isn't developed anymore. Um, so those are older devices. The, the Glan tank is only available in Japan. The Intel is interesting because Wouter um, just in the last few weeks did the port and just committed the, the final pieces to Debian installer. Um, so that's a very new, uh, I mean, new in the sense of um, that we support it in Debian, but the device itself is, is not new itself. So that's that Intel box. Um, and then you have the, the Ficus, which is actually what we use on, on most of our um, build Ds. Um, so that has been supported for quite a while. The, the next one is the Mavel uh, Orion, and that's basically what, what we support best at the moment um, in, in Lenny. So we have the, the D-Link DNS uh, 232, uh, 323, um, and that support was added by, by Matt Palmer. Um, so that was actually added after Lenny, or he, he sent some patches, but they were too late for Lenny. But we actually added that as part of a point release. So, so that's supporting, and that's very good because this device uh, is pretty cheap. Um, it's, then we support the HP um, device, but the, the problem with that is it's not very easily available in Europe. Um, you can get it, I think, in the UK, um, and you, you can buy it in the States, but um, most other countries in Europe um, don't have it. And the, the Kura Box Pro um, support was added uh, by, by Pear, who's here in the audience, um, in a Google Sum of Code project last year. Um, again, that works pretty well, but the, the Kura Box is, is, again, more aimed at developers. The, the device you can buy in the shop is called the Link Station, and it would be very easy to support because it's very similar to the Core Box, but no one has actually done that work. <clears throat> and then we have the various uh, QNAP devices, so those are definitely the devices with, with the best support. Um, the company has been very helpful, um, very supportive, and the only problem with those is they're a little bit uh, expensive. And the last one is the, the Marvell Kirkwood line. So the Marvell Orion basically goes, is about 500 megahertz, and the new Kirkwood uh, is about one or two gigahertz, so it's, it's much faster, also it's much faster I.O. And that is currently uh, being worked on, so I integrated uh, Debian installer support, but again, we, we need to actually make a new release for that. So how does the whole thing actually work? Um, so if, if you're interested in, in, in adding support for a new device, what do you need to do? And for, for developers, um, you basically need a serial console. I mean, that, that's something you need because otherwise you don't see what's, what's going on and you need to boot the kernel and you need to see if that actually works. Um, so that's definitely something you need. Um, JTAG, I, I listed here, but I have never needed JTAG. I mean, you only need that if you, if you override the, the bootloader and then you have to rescue the, the system, but um, I have never done it um, because we don't actually touch the bootloader. Um, another thing which is very important is that we need to have working um, kernel support in the mainline kernel so that there used to be some devices which were very nice, but they only had a, you know, uh, a, a kernel which, which was a, a vendor kernel which wasn't the main line and that's just something which we can't support. I mean, we, uh, the kernel pol team has a policy against keeping uh, big patches around um, and it's, it's just a big nightmare. Um, <clears throat> and obviously it, it helps if you have a good relationship with, with the hardware company that there may be some things you need to know um, or that uh, there are some things you can do better if you have certain information. But obviously, even, even without any contact, you, you, can, you can reverse engineer uh, most, uh, most things and just port it. For users, it's, it's very different. Um, so what, what we have been trying to do is to make it really easy um, for users. Because if you, if you look at some, some other distros or some other um, how-tos about how to install Debian, it's basically a long list of you, you need to do that, you need to partition the disk, you need to form, format it, you need to do that, and then you need to change the, the, the config of the bootloader. And to us, 
it all seems very easy. I mean, it's, you know, it's just a list. You do those steps and then it works. Um, but what I found is uh, it, it's not easy. Um, for, for users, um, you really need something simple like the Debian installer. And, and the nice thing about this is that the, the installer on those uh, devices works the same as on a PC. So you, you don't have to do anything <coughs> manually. You, you just run the installer and, and the installer does everything for you. Um, so the, the way it works is um, that because those devices don't have any you know, VGA output um, or, or keyboard, the way it works is that we run an SSH server on the machine and you connect um, to it with SSH and then um, the installer starts and, and you just go through everything. So you, you just need SSH, internet, you don't need serial console, you don't need to do anything manually, so it, it's really easy. Um, so the, the way it works is um, most of those um, devices, I mean, they, they run some firmware and they have some firmware upgrade mechanisms. So usually you go to the web interface and then you, you can give it some firmware image and, and then it will upload that and, and reboot and, and, and that's the upgrade. So what we do, um, we basically supply a firmware image for, for those devices and each of those devices obviously have their own way of, of packaging the, the firmware. Um, so that's something that needs to be done for each device separately. But we basically generate a firmware image um, which contains Debian installer. So when people upgrade their firmware, what happens is that the Debian kernel is written to Flash and the, uh, and the RAM disk containing the installer is written to Flash and then they reboot, um, the installer starts, um, the installer reads the existing network configuration from the device, usually that's stored in flash or maybe on the disk. It brings up SSH and then people can log in. Um, and, and then, like I said before, it's, it's a normal installation. Um, at the end of things, so the, the installer knows about those devices, it knows exactly what it needs to do. Um, and at the end, the new kernel, the Debian kernel, and a RAM disk which boots Debian from, from disk um, is written to flash. Or depending on some machines actually boot from disk, but again, um, the installer knows about that and, and will just generate a bootable image. Um, so it, it's really very, very easy. Um, so some of the, the philosophy we, which we have is we try, if possible, not to touch the bootloader or the configuration of the bootloader. Um, basically, um, we want to make it easy for people to, to also go back to the original firmware if, if they want to do that. And we certainly don't change the bootloader um, because if we did that, we might brick the machine because if, if, if you flash something wrong, then the machine is just not gonna start anymore. So we, we have a policy ag against doing that. And the other thing, like I said, we don't require uh, any any manual steps. I mean, usually you have a firmware image and you just upload that via the via the web interface. On some machines, you need to do to do some uh, a couple of commands manually, but that's the the exception really. And that's just to get the installer working. The installer itself is is really automatic. Um, so some of the the tools um, behind that. Um, so like I said, um, we need to to bring up SSH um, and we need to use some configuration and so what we could do we, we could just use some standard IP address um, but uh, the decision I, I made back then was to reuse the network configuration which which they have used for for the machine because that that seemed the most sensible approach so I've, I've written a tool which is called old Swiss pre-seed which basically reads the network configuration and, and nothing else, and, and precedes the installer with that. Um, and again, that's something which is very specific to the machine. So some of them uh, use a Unix file system in, in Flash, so you, you, you pass that. Um, some of them have their own um, for config format, so that's really just something 
you need to look at the machine, see how uh, reverse engineer how it works, and then write um, support for old Swiss preseed. And the, the other tool is Flash Kernel. Um, so it, it's called that way because traditionally, um, uh, when I started, we, all, we had devices um, that always booted from Flash. Nowadays, we also support devices that boot from the disk. Um, so nowadays, Flash Kernel can either flash the kernel or write the kernel to flash or generate a specific bootable image on disk. Um, so we, we, we do that depending on you know, what, how the machine is configured. Um, so we, we support about 15 devices in flash kernel these days. It's, it's very easy to extend. Um, so I think uh, Wouter, who just did it, um, can, can vouch for that. It's, it's just a, a few lines of code uh, depending on, on the machine. It's, it's pretty simple. And as I said before, we don't, we don't change the bootloader config. Um, we try to, to not make any changes to the, to the system, except for, of course, installing Debian and you know, replacing um, the, the system in Flash. Um, but that's replaceable again. So what we do, because we don't contro control the, the kernel command line, and, and usually, they, they, those machines usually boot from Flash directly. So they have a, a RAM disk in Flash. So they usually uh, pass something like root uh, is def mem uh, to, uh, to the kernel, which obviously doesn't work, because in our case, the, the, the root device is, is a disk. Um, and so the, the way we have solved that is, it's not very elegant, but, but it works, is that Flash kernel contains a hook for initRAMFS. So when you generate the RAM disk, um, the, the root device is directly written into the RAM disk. Um, so that's loaded, and then the RAM disk will see, oh yeah, um, boot from disk, and, and it will do that. Um, so how, how, do you support, how do you add support to Debian, to Debian installer? It's, it's actually... It's actually not that much work if, if you think about it. I mean, the, the major work is really testing everything and, and, and making sure, uh, and, and reverse engineering. Um, that, that usually takes some, some time, just figuring out, well, how does the machine boot? Um, I mean, on, on, on our machines, the, uh, you, you also need kernel support, and, and usually that's not there. Um, and, and adding that if the platform is supported is, is pretty easy. Um, but there are some things um, that need to be considered. So for example, on ARM, every machine has a machine ID. Um, so the bootloader passes a ID to the kernel which says which device it is. Um, it's nice, it's a unique ID. The, the only problem with that is most of those companies don't understand that it's a unique ID. So they just use some, some bogus value, um, usually from the development board. Um, so what, what we actually need to do is you need to register a machine ID um, and then you need to override the machine ID passed by the, the, the bootloader. Um, so th those are just a couple of things you, you need to know um, if, if you want to work with those devices, but it's, it's not you know, black, ma black magic or anything. And Matt Palmer actually has written a really good how-to uh, about some of those issues, about how to get serial console access, um, how to, to, to port uh, the kernel and, and things like that. But in, in terms of, so if you, if you have done that and reversed engineer how, how the firmware works, uh, how the config file, what, what it looks like, then adding Debian installer support is actually pretty easy. Um, so um, so th there are two things that need to be done. The first thing is um, you need to add support for the sub-architecture. So that's sort of the, the CPU. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about ARM because that's where I have the experience, but something similar probably applies to, to PowerPC and other devices. But on, on ARM, um, there are different platforms um, and different devices can use the same kernel if they, if they uh, use the same platform. So if you want to add a new platform, you obviously need a kernel image in, in the Debian kernel. And then um, what the installer does it, it takes the kernel and then it generates UDEMPs out of that kernel. Um, so what you need to do, the, the second step is to actually generate those UDEMPs. 
then the, the third step um, is that base installer needs to know which kernel to install for each platform. So you just need to edit one file and say, if it's this platform, install that kernel. Um, but that's really a, a one-liner. Um, the other thing is you need to know for the platform which disk label is being used. Um, and so in the past, you had to edit um, this file and say, this platform uses this disk label. But actually, nowadays, on ARM at least, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, because Rico said, well, all of those devices use the MS-DOS um, partitioning label anyway. So let's just assume that on ARM. So you don't need to change that, but on other devices you do. The other thing is um, for automatic partitioning, um, you may want to specify a specific uh, disk layout, partitioning layout for that platform. So that's another thing that can be done. But again, that's trivial. Usually you just copy uh, the recipes from a different platform and, and then maybe make some changes. Um, so most of those things are really like one-line changes or very simple things. And then the other thing is uh, package lists. Um, so when the Debian installer generates the, the boot images, it needs to know which kind of UDEPs to include. And, and that, again, depends on which platform, uh, which kind of image, uh, and on the specific sub-architecture. So you just need to add one file. But again, that's something you could just copy from different sub-architecture. And the final thing is install a build config specifies which sub-architectures are being built. So you just need to add the new sub-architecture to that. But that's basically it. Um, and then to actually add a device, um, in addition to adding the, the platform, uh, you need to, so on, on, on ARM, uh, if you look at proc CPU info, there is a machine string which specifies which machine you're running on. So you just need to, to edit that file and then put in that string and say which platform it is. So again, that's a one-liner. Um, then like you probably need old Swiss pre seed support. Um, that's optional because some devices don't have any config file. And so in that case, what you can do instead, you can just put a pre seed file into the RAM disk, which, uh, for example, tries to do TCP, and if that fails, it will fall back to some static IP address. Um, and then, obviously, you will need flash kernel support, um, so the, the machine will actually boot. And then you need to, to edit install a build config again to um, build a specific image for that device. And, and again, that depends on, on, on your device, and maybe it's very simple. Um, but that could also involve, for example, packaging um, some tool to create uh, a firmware image for that device. So it, it really depends on, on the device. Um, so what, what are some of the, the problems uh, users run into? So I've, I've been doing this for quite a while and I've, I've seen many uh, different problems, um, but the most common are, are listed here. So Something and some of those problems have fortunately been fixed in in newer releases of of the installer. So, for example, something we a problem we used to have is that old Swiss preseed um, that um, for example, if um, the the problem with the installer when it brings up the network is it needs to know everything about the network. So it needs to 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 know things like DNS. Which, which don't really matter if you just want to log in with SSH. You could always fix DNS later on. Um, but the, the install is built in a way that it needs to know all of those things. Otherwise, it, it won't bring up the network. And so uh, some of the things that happened in the past is, for example, if people have, a, a conf have configured their device, but they didn't put in DNS, um, then the, the installer would start. Old Swiss Pre-Seed would, would look at the the config would see, oh, we have that IP address, um, let's do that. Um, and then it will see, oh, we don't have DNS, and then suddenly it will pop up the screen saying, please enter DNS. But obviously, because people don't have a serial console and because SSH is not running at that point, um, the machine is, is stuck. And it's the same with the gateway. And there was actually a bug that there was no way to precede 
that you don't have a gateway. Um, so if you don't have a gateway, we, which uh, you can have, then again, it would be stuck. But fortunately, all of those things have, have been resolved. So nowadays, if the network configuration is, is incomplete or also if it's invalid, um, it would just do DHCP and, and have some fallback IP address. So that, that was just something that we used to see a bit. Um, uh, another problem is that users assume a different network configuration. So the documentation is quite clear how the installer reads uh, the network, so what it does. So for example, um, if, if DHCP fails, it will use that IP address. Um, but apparently some, some people um, get that wrong and they look for the, the, the machine on a different IP address. And, and they say, well, I, I can't find it. Um, and that's pretty tough for us because there is no way, those machines don't have any LCD, so we can't show, you know, please connect to that IP address and, and, and use that password or anything. So uh, it's just a user problem. Um, I, I should say it was uh, partly maybe it was my fault because uh, one thing I did was so most of those devices have some default IP address. Um, so when you, when you plug it in, um, it will just come up with that IP address. And I was trying to be really smart and I said, well, maybe in that case, I mean, that means they haven't really configured the machine. So maybe in that case, they don't want to have that IP address. So let's do DHCP instead. And, and that probably confused some people as well. Um, but again, I, I, I changed that. Um, another problem is uh, Debian installer, uh, it doesn't boot if you add a second disk. Um, so finally that has been, is going to be resolved um, because uh, Colin Watson recently changed the installer to use uh, UUIDs. Um, but that was a, a fairly common problem. And obviously w what can also happen is that you flash a non-working kernel or, or init RAMFS. So that's something which doesn't happen very often, um, but we, we had a problem once a while. For example, once we, we didn't notice that on some devices the init RAMFS that was generated uh, was too large to actually fit into Flash because there were so many modules, um, and that was only caught a little bit too late. Um, but then we, we just you know, didn't build a couple of, of modules. So that was not, never part of a stable release or anything. Um, but in unstable, those things can happen. Um, the most common um, thing I get is I turn machine on, the, the machine on, it always worked, but now it doesn't boot. And, and I have no idea why. Um, I mean, I have a serial console. For me, it, it usually boots. Uh, I've never ran, really ran into any problems, but there, there are so many users. Uh, or every, you know, regularly, I get an email. It always worked, and now it doesn't boot. And I simply have no idea what's going on, and I really don't have any good way to find out because those people don't have a serial console. And my, my suspicion is that in many cases, it's just that, that the, the file system check is running and that they weren't patient enough and maybe rebooted the machine and you know, then it was stuck and maybe asked uh, whether it should repair the file system. But that's just something that, that's not very, very ideal um, and, and that's something we should try to improve um, some way or another. Um, and, and finally, the, the big lesson I learned, I mentioned that before, but manual instructions don't work. I mean, even if they're really simple, uh, or, or you would think so, uh, people are gonna get it wrong. Um, and, and I know that simply because the way the install on those machines works is it, it's, it's a netboot image, which means the, image, the installer image itself is, is very small and it needs to download additional UDAPs <laughs> or installer components from the network, which means when we prepare a new release of the installer, um, things get broken because the the old image assumes to find things on the network which are not there anymore. And, and so we had that problem uh, at some point that the old image was broken, but the new image was delayed. 
for various reasons, and I think it was several months that we didn't have the installer working on, on those devices. And so what I did instead was to, to create a, a tarball of Debian um, uh, with some instructions, you know, partition the disk, uh, make a boot uh, partition, uh, do that, um, untar the tarball, yeah, all pretty simple stuff. And it's amazing how much email I got <laughs> from people saying, you know, it doesn't work, it doesn't boot, or I, I did that wrong. And uh, it's really amazing. Um, so having the installer, I, I think that that's so good. And, and I think Debian is, is really quite popular on those devices simply because of that. Um, so I'd, I'd really like to thank the, the installer team for, for making something that's so easy to extend. Uh, it, like I said before, I mean, it's a couple of, of lines of code here and there, and, and suddenly things work. Um, so the, the future, what, what are the things uh, we, we would like to see? So one of them is persistent disk name and naming, and, and that's actually done. Um, so that's very nice. Um, another thing some people have asked for is, well, wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of rescue system in Flash? So if Debian doesn't boot, um, we could somehow start that rescue system and, and you know, do something. And, and in theory, I think that's a very good idea. Um, the question is just, well, how do you want to do it? Uh, and I think there are a couple of options. I mean, one of them would be to use the Debian installer. Um, but then you would need to both keep the RAM disk to boot from disk as well as the installer around. And most machines don't have enough uh, flash for that. The, the other option would be somehow to extend the, the Debian RAM disk with some rescue options. And, and Rico did some work on that. Um, and the, the final approach, which I kind of like, um, but which, which I'm personally not going to work on, is actually, well, do we actually have to, to put Debian in flash? Um, wouldn't it be nice, I, I mean, there are systems which actually run from Flash uh, and that, they're, that are made for that. So why don't we put something like Open Embedded into Flash and use that to put Debian if there is a disk? So we, we could simply use something like KXAC um, to put Debian from disk. And if there is no disk, well, you just have Open Embedded, but at least you have something. Um, so I think that that's a nice idea. And from the Debian side, it, it would be pretty simple because we would just make sure if there is open embedded in, in Flash, well, then don't write Debian to Flash um, or ask the user if they want to overwrite it or if they want to keep it. Um, but I don't know anything about open embedded, so someone would need to do the, the other side, um, making the, you know, the, the KXX stuff and checking if there is a disk and, and those kind of things. Um, but I, I think that would be a pretty nice solution. Um, the other thing is, um, well, why don't you put a SSH server into the RAM disk? Um, that would be useful for a number of reasons. So, for example, my NAS machine is encrypted, so I need to enter a passphrase. Um, so I can do that because I have a serial console, but for other people, um, well, that wouldn't work. But if you put SSH into the, the RAM disk, you, you could connect and then enter the, the passphrase. Um, and the other reason is, well, maybe we could somehow see the boot uh, process on, on SSH. Um, there is also something called uh, Network Console, Net Console in the kernel, which can broadcast um, the, the kernel output on the network. But the problem is that that only does kernel stuff. So when you reach user land, it stops. So uh, it probably doesn't show why Debian doesn't boot. And, and that's, the, that's the problem. Um, another feature request is uh, support installations to, to Flash. Um, so PES is working on that. And finally, I mean, there are always new devices. Um, so the Mavell Kirkwood platform is, is something I'm currently working on. Um, there are a couple of interesting devices like the, the Shiva plug and some NAS devices. Um, and then you have the Freescale, the, the OMAP, um, it sort of, uh, that, that sort of goes into the direction of netbooks. Uh, but I think, well, w w 
why just support Nest devices? I mean, we, we have that experience, we have the installer, um, we can also support other devices, and I think netbooks, um, those ARM-based ones, are, are really going to be interesting. Um, and finally, um, so all the work I've been doing is on ARM. Um, uh, that has historical reasons um, that someone gave me some hardware. And it's also nice because of that machine ID. So you always know exactly on which device you run, and then you can really customize it. Um, but I think even on, on, on things like x86, you, you could look at, I think, DMI information and find out something. Because um, we are seeing um, those devices, quite a few are now actually based on, on x86. Um, but you can't just use the regular installer because those machines actually boot from flash instead of from, from disk. And that's something we, we need to support. So we need to figure out in the installer which machine is it and, and then extend flash kernel. Um, but, but I think that's it. So um, I, f I think, like I said, I think it's, it's really, there, there are quite a few users. And I think if you, if, you, if you look at other distros, I think Debian has much better support than, than everyone, anyone else. Um, so, and and it's, it's those kind of things. I mean, if, if we go back to the question about the universal operating system, I mean, I think if everyone, you know, all of us just focus on one area and, and make Debian better than anyone else in that area, then I think we will get there. Um, <laughs> so are there any, any questions? <laughs> Why is anyone just hungry for food? <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> Uh, you said before that the Shiba plant was going to be shipped without a serial and, uh, and the GTAC port? Yeah, so, so th well, that's something I'm not sure about. So, so the Shiba plug is actually a couple of different things. So because this, de this design, um, anyone can produce those, those machines. So Maveli is really very open about that. They just want you know, anyone to produce them. So. What's called the Shiva plug is the the development kit, um, uh, and that has the the mini USB with, with serial and JTAG and the the SD card. Um, but for example, there is something called the Pogo plug, which is essentially the same, but it doesn't have the serial. So th there are people who have already opened it up and and connected one, but it doesn't come by by default. And so I don't know. So I, I read that press release that Buffalo and a couple of other big companies are going to produce devices based on that design. But I don't know if they're going to include the serial or not. So my assumption is they're probably not going to include it. Um, and, and so again, when, when you buy such a device, you just have to make sure which one you buy. Because they're, they're very similar, but with slight variations. So the the Mavel uh, Shiva plug development kit, which is linked from my website, for example, um, that has the, the serial console, but at the moment it's being shipped from the States. Um, so from people, for people from Europe, they have to uh, usually pay um, import tax. Um, but hopefully that's also going to be resolved. So I, I told Mavel about that. Um, I mean, they, they now, <laughs> have the, the model with the, the European connector and the UK connector, but it's still shipped from, from the States. So, um, but hopefully the next step is actually to ship it w within Europe. Um, Without the serial, it will be very hard to hack on, on the device. And yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, well, I mean, you, you, can, you could still open it up and connect your own serial, but I mean, that, that's, th this device is, is so much fun particular because it has all that stuff built in. Um, so yeah, just, just make sure you, you get this one and not any of the variants. Yeah, and here are just a, a couple of links. So it's also a pretty good uh, documentation on, on the web. I think there is. <laughs>
Do you know if the Shiva plug design or any other modern design uh, also supports some faster way to connect the disk, like SATA or external SATA or whatever? Um, but the, the, the NAS devices, uh, for, so for example, the, the QNAP um, has one internal or two internal disks and it has uh, external SATA as well. Um, but, but this one only has USB. It, it, it's funny because when, when, when it was announced, everyone looked at it and said, oh, it's perfect. It just lacks this one feature. And, and the cool thing was everyone had a different request. So there were some people <laughs> who said, well, I'd like to have power over, over Ethernet. The other guy said, I'd like to have uh, network over power. <laughs> um, some people would like to have two USB. And you know, if, if, you, if you produce you know, all of that, it's probably that device, which, which actually brings me, just reminds me. Um, so this one is really cool, but another device which, which they have, uh, which, which I'm, I'm currently waiting for, um, is, is also pretty cool. It's called the OpenRD client. So it's, it's based on the same platform and everything, but it has all those, uh, uh, all those connectors you just asked for, like, like external SATA, and it also has VGA. So you can actually use that as a thin client, and I think that's going to be really cool. Um, but I don't know if, I think they're actually being shipped, um, but I'm not sure about that. And I think it's, it's about $200 or 250 so it, it's, not, it's not expensive. Yeah, so, so that would probably be what you're looking for, OpenRD. Okay, so in, if there are no other questions, um, thanks very much.